Hello, and welcome to the Columbus Grove Christian Church. This is for Sunday, July 26th. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are here today to magnify the name of Jesus Christ. We are here to give you glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we come as your children to receive the good gifts that you want to give us today. Lord, we acknowledge that we are in a trying time in our lives, our families, our church, and our nation. But Lord, we declare the faithfulness of God. Great is your faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with you. Lord, we pray not just for us, but we pray for all of the churches that gather in your name. We pray for the churches of our community, Church of the Good Shepherd, St. John, St. Anthony's, Lord, every church in this region and around the world that calls on the name of Jesus. We pray that Christ would be lifted up and that people would be drawn to him. In Christ's name, amen. Please join me in the call to worship, and this is Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing, sing praise, praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced.
appeared to Solomon at Gibeon. He spoke to him in a dream during the night. God said, ask for anything you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have been very kind to my father David, your servant. That's because he was faithful to you. He did what was right, his heart was honest, and you have continued to be very kind to him. You have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. Lord my God, you have now made me king. You have put me in the place of my father David, but I am only a little child. I don't know how to carry out my duties. I am here among the people you have chosen. They are a great nation. They are more than anyone can count. So give me a heart that understands then I can rule over your people. I can tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Who can possibly rule over the, this great nation of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for that. So he, God said to him, You have not asked to live a long time. You have not asked to be wealthy. You have not even asked to have your enemies killed. Instead, you have asked for wisdom. You want to do what is right and fair when you judge people. Because that is what you have asked for, I will give it to you. I will give you a wise and understanding heart. So here is what will be true of you. There has never been anyone like you, and they will never be. The Word of God says that God loves a cheerful giver. And so I want to encourage us to give our gifts cheerfully. And also in this difficult season, let's pray for God to show us those around us who may be in need and need some financial help from us. We always want to see those that are our neighbors who stand in need of our help. Because all good things come from God. Let's praise God from whom all blessings flow. It is such a great equalizer. No one comes to the Lord's table, I hope, and says, well, I don't need as much of God's mercy as Elaine Mayberry. She's the one that really needs mercy, or Matt Reed. No, we come 
knowing it's only by God's grace. It's because of his wonderful mercy. How can it be that he loves all of us so much that he gave his own son for his body to be broken and his blood to be shed for us? So we don't ever need to pretend with God. We don't act, need to act like we're something that we are not. We don't need to have any illusions about ourselves. God doesn't have any illusions about us. So when we come to our prayer of confession, it's just good for us to do that freely and wholeheartedly and thoroughly. You know, I, I, want, I want to confess everything I, I believe that the Lord's laid on my heart or that I'd be aware of and ask for His mercy. Which, he's, which he freely gives, and then we should live in the joy of that mercy. Let's come to our prayer of confession. Our Father in heaven, we are sorry that we have sinned against you. There are things we have done that were sinful, and there were also good things we should have done that we didn't do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved others as we love ourselves. Specifically, I repent of. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent, because Jesus died on the cross to pay the debt for our sins. Please forgive us and change us and make us more like Jesus. Amen. O Lord our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah! How wonderful is that? Thank you that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Thank you, Lord, that you like to forgive us. You want us to come and confess our sins. And Lord, at the same time, we ask for your help. Lord, we sure cannot change ourselves and make ourselves like Jesus Christ. We come and pray for the empowering presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, your word says we're partakers of the divine nature. Help us, Lord, to put to death what is of the old nature each day. And, and as it says in Galatians 5, to walk, walk with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be led by your word and by your spirit. May we live today and tomorrow, even in the midst of this crazy COVID-19 time, I pray that our faith and hope would rise. Lord, I pray for those gathered for this service and those who watch it on YouTube. Lord, you know the specific needs we have. You know where we're afraid, or we have a financial need, where there's stress or friction, or we're discouraged. Lord, you know when a sparrow falls, you know the needs of each one. And I ask in the name of Jesus that you would bless your people. Each one, Lord, you know the cry of their heart, what they're crying out to you in this moment for you to do in their life. And in the name of Jesus, I pray along with them. Lord, give them what they need for life and godliness. How wonderful you are. How we magnify your name because of your love and faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that in unity with your church, in Columbus Grove and around the world and through the centuries, we have the privilege of praying the prayer that you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Please turn in your Bibles to Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. Every time I'm reading in a different translation, this time is the New English translation. But I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And by flesh, we're not talking about skin and bone, but our old sinful nature. For the flesh has desires that are opposed to the Spirit, and the Spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh. For these are in opposition to each other, so that you cannot do what you want. But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. I am warning you, as I have warned you before, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and for today, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited provoking one another, being jealous of one another. Isn't it good news that God is so amazing that He wants to produce in us the fruit of the Spirit, which is faithfulness? Now, just a heads up. There's one word in Greek that's translated faithfulness, and the same word is translated faith in English. It's the same Greek word. It's also the the same word from which we get trust and believing. It's one Greek word from which we get all those English words. So we're going to talk about faith and faithfulness. Here, here are the three things we're going to look at tonight. First of all, faith about who or what. Secondly, faith or faithfulness. And thirdly, some examples of faithfulness. First of all, faith about who or what. We've already declared our faith tonight. When we together along with Christians through the centuries, said the Nicene Creed. This is the important thing. We Christians, we disagree on the most amazing array of crazy little things. That's why in the Protestant world, there's between 35 and 45,000 different denominations. You have a church, and somebody says, well... I think Christ is coming back this way, and so I think we should baptize this way. And with Protestants, what we've done historically is some of us quit and start another church. It's just so sad. And the faith, what we should be proclaiming, as I said earlier, isn't our particular views. If here at the Christian church, if what we're proclaiming is the Jeff Eubank spin on things, you guys need to find another church. You need to find some place that proclaims Jesus Christ. It's not about some private personal views we have on things. It's not about our political views. It's not about our taste in music or even our style of worship preferences. It's about who is Jesus Christ and what has he done. Now, sadly, there are a lot of people who would, could say the Nicene Creed with us and say, I believe that. But that doesn't mean that they put their faith in Jesus Christ. There's a difference between believing the truth of the faith and actually a belief, a faith, that leads to commitment. You know, the book of James says, even the demons know that this is true. They know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died and rose again, and He's returning, and they're going to be forever in the lake of fire. They know that. And the, it says they believe and tremble. So we must never, ever stop at mere intellectual assent to the truth of Christ. That's not saving faith. Maybe we can illustrate saving faith this way. I don't know if you folks have ever heard about the great Blondin. Who's ever heard about the great Blondin? See some puzzled looks. 
he was an amazing tightrope walker. He was one of the early famous ones that kind of led other people into this. And he was famous especially for going across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And I think it was like late 1800s, maybe 1890. And he had a tightrope across, and he'd walk back and forth. And I think there were like 25,000 people that were watching. They're like, yeah, this is great. Wouldn't that be amazing to see? And, and then he does what seems to me a ridiculous thing. He went over on a bicycle. And then he went over with a wheelbarrow. Just a wheelbarrow across. And then he said, how many think that I could go across this rope with a wheelbarrow with somebody sitting in it? Everybody says, yes, yes, we believe that. And he said, any volunteers? <laughs> you know, and of course there were no volunteers. Actually, I guess what, the, what they said was, he eventually took his manager on his back across once. You see, there's a difference between believing that Blondin can take somebody in a wheelbarrow on a tightrope across Niagara Falls and being willing to volunteer. Now, you can sort of see the comparison with Christianity, but here's the difference. How do you think Blondin died? Give me a guess. How do you think he died? I'll tell you this, he did not die while performing. He died because he was diabetic. All those stunts he pulled, he succeeded. But you know what? He was human, and it's just possible he could have failed. And here's the big difference. Jesus Christ is God. He never fails. We can trust him with our life. We saw last week that He is goodness. Everything about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is good. There's not one thing in God's Word that He says, live this way, and it's less than the best for you. The Lord loves us so much, He laid down His life on the cross for us. And saving faith is when we not only believe the truth about Christ, but we're willing to commit ourselves. So I would say it this way. Saving faith is the commitment to the truth of Christ. That results in wanting and choosing to yield control of one's life to the Lordship of Christ and demonstrating our love for Him with obedience to His commands. I'll say it again. Saving faith is the commitment to the truth of Christ that results in wanting and choosing to yield control of one's life to the Lordship of Christ and demonstrating our love for Him with our obedience to his commands. Now, if you haven't noticed, and I'm pretty sure you did, we don't obey his commands perfectly. And that's why we confess our sins. I, I endeavor to do that every day. But a Christian is somebody who wants to please God, who believes his commands are life. There's a lot, a lot of nonsense today that says, you know, as long as you believe stuff about Jesus, you can live any way you want. That's utterly and horribly false. Now, many are afraid to trust their life to Christ. Sometimes, sometimes people think they have and they haven't. There are, there are many people, even in church, you know, some of the meanest, proudest people you've ever wanted to know have ended up high up in churches. You know, you can study the great saints down through the ages. There have been many who were horrible, ungodly, proud, stubborn people. And you wonder, well, how did they arrive, you know, get these positions in a church? You know, just because somebody's a pastor or a bishop or a pope doesn't make them right with God. To be right with God, we have to humble ourselves as a little child, not just like for a few fading seconds to become a Christian, but that's the Christian life. Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Sometimes people don't submit their lives to Christ. That category can't because they don't even see. They think they've already done it. They think they're already right with God. They're awesome. But there, there are a lot of people among us who who want, who believe the truth of Christ, and they're afraid to commit their lives to Him because they've been so hurt. And God does not despise their fear. 
And if that's you, or that's somebody you're praying for, you can just ask for help. Say, Lord, I know I should trust you completely with my life, but after what was done to me, I've become more controlling with my life. I, I trust people less, and it's just hard for me to get over this hump. Just ask for his help, and he will graciously help you with that. So, faith about who or what? It's Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. And, and the, the faith that counts is the faith that commits ourselves saying, I don't want to be in charge of my life. I, I, I want and choose the Lordship of Christ. I want to follow him and obey his ways. Well, now let's talk a little bit about faith or faithfulness. Now, the King James translated this word for the fruit of the Spirit as faith. And there are a few, a few translations that do. Most translations say faithfulness. But as I mentioned earlier, it's the same Greek word. So we have to decide how it's best translated. I think some Christians are afraid of translating it faithfulness. Some Christians, they get nervous if you start talking about God producing faithfulness in us. Like, they so want to emphasize that we are saved by faith. Are we saved by faith? Absolutely! Saw a good nod back there in the back. Sure. Absolutely we're saved by faith. We're saved by faith in what Christ has done. And some people so emphasize what our faith in what Christ alone has done that they cannot imagine that God in His great mercy and power has done even more. Christ has not only worked on the cross and shed His blood so that we could come to the very day of salvation. He's done such a work by His blood and power that we are made partakers of the divine nature and He's given us His Holy Spirit so that we not only are drawn to faith, but He works to produce faithfulness in us. Like, wouldn't it be a sad thing if people around the world and through the centuries came to Christ and never changed? It's like, well, now someday you'll, you'll go to heaven but you're still going to live in the flesh and go the ways of the enemy your whole life. Well, that would be sad. But that's not the case. Do you see? You see the difference? It's not just faith that brings us to salvation. The Holy Spirit is part of the fruit of the Spirit is producing faithfulness in us. Now, when we came to faith in Christ, God didn't push that on us. He, he wooed us. He doesn't push anybody. He, he draws us. He tries to sh reveal his, our sin and, and the blood of Christ and His great love and mercy. Show us the gospel so that we choose Him. And the same is true of the faithfulness. Because not everyone who's come to Christ is faithful in the same way. Some of us, brothers and sisters, are off on a tangent. You know, we're like, we're like the sheep that wandered off and Jesus hasn't been able to find a way to bring us back yet. You know, Faithfulness happens, as does faith, when we cooperate with the grace of God. It's never pushed on us. It always involves our cooperation. Faith and faithfulness. So praise God that this fruit of the Spirit, which is faith and faithfulness, that it is both. And if you've come to faith, that's probably why you're here tonight. Say, Lord, I pray for more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is faithfulness. I can see areas in my life, Lord, help me to be more faithful. Help me to be more like Jesus. Well, lastly, we want to look at some examples of faithfulness. What does faithfulness mean practically in the life of a Christian? Faithfulness for a Christian means we're faithful to the sacraments, to the means of grace. We come to worship. We come to the Lord's table. Of course, we were baptized. We... Faithfulness for a Christian means we know we're faithful in the Word of God and prayer because we're not trying to go on the fumes of the past. We need God's direction. Secondly, a faithful Christian shows their faithfulness in their work. One of the ways we witness to the reality of Christ in our lives is to be a good employee or for an employer, a good employer because of our faithfulness. 
Now, a lot of people in the workplace think they can steal from the company. They think they don't have to put in a good day's work. They can skip days, come in late. All that is stealing. A faithful Christian wants to be faithful in his work because as it says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work out of it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for human bosses. So, you know, you can have, probably most of us have had terrible jobs at some point in our life. But we can rejoice because we say, Lord, I'm doing this for you, and thank you for your provision right in this season. Thirdly, faithfulness with money and when no one is looking. I said one time, I remember, you can see how long ago this was. I was with my grandfather Williams, that's Nancy Jones's father, and I was staying for the week with my grandparents, which was one of my favorite things to do in Lyme, Ohio, and he needed something, so he and I went over to Rick's. How many remember Rick's? Come on, Matt, what's wrong? Yeah, that was a long time ago. So. I don't remember what he got, but when we got home, I remember what happened. He suddenly realized with horror that he walked out of the store and didn't pay for what he got. And, you know, some people would have said, well, I'll make sure next time I pay. He immediately went back and said, here, I'm sorry I made a mistake, and he paid for, for the very small item that it was. And that was a lesson to me of not only faithfulness with money, but the faithfulness to do what is right when no one would know. A faithful person does what's right because we're most of all trying to please God. It, we're, we're, not trying to, we're not trying to live a life so somebody thinks we're a good guy. That's, that's not living. We're Christian life properly. We, we try to do the right thing because we love Jesus. Fourthly, faithfulness and suffering. I don't know if the name Eric Little means anything to you. I loved the movie when it came out a long time ago, Chariots of Fire, um, which is a true story about this fine Christian man who was a great runner, and he was in the Olympics. Any, anybody know this story? It was in the 20s, and he was in Britain, and he was a Scotsman, and his family were missionaries in China. And, and they kind of didn't want him to take time to be a runner, but he was really good at it. So he came to the Olympics, and on the boat, which was, the Olympics were in France, on the boat over from England, they found out that the heat he was going to have to run, you know how it is, we've all watched track here in Columbus Grove, or a great track town, right? He was running in the heat on Sunday, but here's the tricky bit. Now this wouldn't have been my conviction, but it, it was his conviction that you didn't do sports on Sunday, that, that sports were only for the Lord. I don't think sports on Sunday should keep us from God's house, but I think sports the rest of the day is fine, but that's my personal view on that. But he, he, he went and told the Olympic officials from Britain, I can't run on, on Sunday, I'm not going to do it. And they said, well, you know, it's just, it's only a heat. And they tried to get him to go against his convictions and he wouldn't do it. So, uh, he was out. You know, he... He, he was going to run, oh boy, I should have checked up on this. I think he was going to run the, the 100 meter. And he was very fast, one of the fastest in the world. But he just said, no, I, my, my allegiance to Christ is uppermost. But finally, one of the other men on the team who was a hurdler said, look, I've already got a, a bronze or silver in the hurdles. How about you let Eric Little run the 400 for me? He wasn't a 400 runner. He was a hundred runner. So, you know, he said, sure, just for an opportunity to run in the Olympics, I'll do that. And so they, they let him switch places, and he ran in the 400. And he won the Olympic gold. Now, that's not the most important thing. A lot of people have won Olympic golds, but very few have won Olympic golds standing for their Christian principles. And like I said, I wouldn't view that exactly as he did, but he had to do that because that's what he believed. But when he really showed his faith in Christ was when he went back as a missionary to China and they were taken over by the Japanese and he and other missionaries were in a prisoner of war camp. And pressure, if you haven't noticed, reveals what's inside of us. And other missionaries just became 
grabby and selfish and just out for themselves like all the veneer of Christian love was gone. You know, they're just fighting for themselves. And, and, and he died in that prisoner of war camp. But everyone there said he served others in love to his dying day. You see, that's an example of faithfulness. Not just in the best of times, but when the pressure of the world comes around us. Well, I also want to tell this story, and it might be an urban legend, but I, I heard it as though it were true. It's a wealthy man was in a very prestigious area, uh, you know, out of the country club or something, there was a dance, and he was a, he was a very, very wealthy man. He was dancing with some young lady, and he said, would you sleep with me for a million dollars? And she said, well, sure. And he said, well, how about a hundred dollars? And she slapped him and said, what kind of girl do you think I am? And he said, we've already established that. Now we're just talking Christ. <laughs> you, you often hear the phrase, you often hear the phrase, every man has his price. Not every Christian man. A Christian man, every day, wants to please God most. And so, you know, as Christians, no matter what, somebody would bribe us or pay us to do the wrong thing. It's never just a little thing. We always want to say yes to Jesus. And finally, there's a faithfulness with words, which we just need to remind ourselves. And see, all of these, you know, probably most, most of us need to go back and say, Lord, forgive me, I've not really been faithful in this area. Help me. And He will. He understands that we've not arrived on this journey. But the Lord tells us to be so faithful in our words that we never need to swear. The people will say, if Matt Ream says it, you can take it to the bank. He always tells the truth. Now, who, who is it that always lies? No one. No one. There's not a person on earth that always lies. A liar is the person who does not always tell the truth. And so, Paul said to the Ephesians, Come on, folks. We're in Christ. No more lying. We just have to say, that, you know, to be faithful means, you know, we, that's, that's the way we were before we came to Christ. No more lying then. You know, sometimes we just talk less and that helps. It's amazing. You don't really need to lie. I was, I've been in work situations where my bosses said, lie about this. And you don't have to. There are always other ways of handling that. And then finally, faithfulness in marriage. I often think of a man, I won't say his name because he's from Putnam County. And he was faithful to his wife. I thought of just the most difficult situation I'd ever seen. I mean, if there was ever a time that people would say, well, there's a man that has a, an excuse to not be faithful to his wife. But he was faithful. And he, he's a quiet guy. You probably never heard of him. And I, wouldn't be, I just wouldn't be surprised if we get to heaven. And if there are seats or something closer to Jesus, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those is his. Now, if you start feeling like, boy, this Christianity thing is too hard to talk about faithfulness in the sacraments and faithfulness at work and faithfulness with words, it's, it's too hard. It would be in our strength. And that's why Jesus sent his Holy Spirit who produces the fruit in us as we yield to him. I'm going to read a prayer and ask you to pray this with me. <coughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for your great mercy. Deliver us from unfaithfulness. Deliver us from self-directed lives. Enable us to daily yield all of our lives to you. For the glory of Christ. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That category can't because they don't even see. They think they've already done it. They think they're already right with God. They're awesome. But there, there are a lot of people among us who who want, who believe the truth of Christ, and they're afraid to commit their lives to Him because they've been so hurt. And God does not despise their fear. And if that's you, or that's somebody you're praying for, you can just ask for help. Say, Lord, I know I should trust you completely with my life, but after what was done to me, I've become more controlling with my life. I, I trust people less, and it's just hard for me to get over this hump. Just ask for his help, and he will graciously help you with that. So, 
faith about who or what? It's Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. And, and the, the faith that counts is the faith that commits ourselves saying, I don't want to be in charge of my life. I, I, I want and choose the Lordship of Christ. I want to follow him and obey his ways. Well, now let's talk a little bit about faith or faithfulness. Now, the King James translated this word for the fruit of the Spirit as faith. And there are a few, a few translations that do. Most translations say faithfulness. But as I mentioned earlier, it's the same Greek word. So we have to decide how it's best translated. I think some Christians are afraid of translating it faithfulness. Some Christians, they get nervous if you start talking about God producing faithfulness in us. Like, they so want to emphasize that we are saved by faith. Are we saved by faith? Absolutely. Saw a good nod back there in the back. Sure. Absolutely we're saved by faith. We're saved by faith in what Christ has done. And some people so emphasize what our faith in what Christ alone has done that they cannot imagine that God in his great mercy and power has done even more. Christ has not only worked on the cross and shed his blood so that we could come to the very day of salvation. He's done such a work by his blood and power that we are made partakers of the divine nature and he's given us his Holy Spirit so that we not only are drawn to faith, but he works to produce faithfulness in us. Like, wouldn't it be a sad thing if people around the world and through the centuries came to Christ and never changed? It's like, well, now someday you'll, you'll go to heaven, but you're still going to live in the flesh and go the ways of the enemy your whole life. Well, that would be sad. But that's not the case. Do you see, you see the difference? It's not just faith that brings us to salvation. The Holy Spirit is part of the fruit of the Spirit is producing faithfulness in us. Now, when we came to faith in Christ, God didn't push that on us. He, he wooed us. He doesn't push anybody. He, he draws us. He tries to sh reveal his, our sin and, and the blood of Christ and his great love and mercy. Show us the gospel so that we choose him. And the same is true of the faithfulness. Because not everyone who's come to Christ is faithful in the same way. Some of us, brothers and sisters, are off on a tangent. You know, we're like, we're like the sheep that wandered off and Jesus hasn't been able to find a way to bring us back yet. You know, faithfulness happens, as does faith, when we cooperate with the grace of God. It's never pushed on us. It always involves our cooperation. Faith and faithfulness. So praise God that this fruit of the Spirit, which is faith and faithfulness, that it is both. And if you've come to faith, that's probably why you're here tonight. Say, Lord, I pray for more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is faithfulness. I can see areas in my life, Lord, help me to be more faithful. Help me to be more like Jesus. Well, lastly, we want to look at some examples of faithfulness. What does faithfulness mean practically in the life of a Christian? Faithfulness for a Christian means we're faithful to the sacraments, to the means of grace. We come to worship. We come to the Lord's table. Of course, we were baptized. We, faithfulness for a Christian means we know we're faithful in the word of God and prayer because we're not trying to Go on the fumes of the past. We need God's direction. Secondly, a faithful Christian shows their faithfulness in their work. One of the ways we witness to the reality of Christ in our lives is to be a good employee, or for an employer, a good employer, because of our faithfulness. Now, a lot of people in the workplace think they can steal from the company, they think they don't have to put in a good day's work. They can skip days, come in late. All that is stealing. A faithful Christian wants to be faithful in his work because as it says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work out of it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for human bosses. So you, know, you can have 
Probably most of us have had terrible jobs at some point in our life. But we can rejoice because we say, Lord, I'm doing this for you. And thank you for your provision right in this season. Thirdly, faithfulness with money and when no one is looking. I said one time, I remember, you can see how long ago this was. I was with my grandfather Williams, that's Nancy Jones's father, and I was staying for the week with my grandparents, which was one of my favorite things to do in Lyme, Ohio, and he needed something, so he and I went over to Rick's. How many remember Rick's? Come on, Matt, what's wrong? Yeah, that was a long time ago. So, I don't remember what he got, but when we got home, I remember what happened. He suddenly realized with horror that he walked out of the store and didn't pay for what he got. And, you know, some people would have said, well, I'll make sure next time I pay. He immediately went back and said, here, I'm sorry I made a mistake, and he paid for, for the very small item that it was. And that was a lesson to me of not only faithfulness with money, but the faithfulness to do what is right when no one would know. A faithful person does what's right because we're most of all trying to please God. It, we're, we're, not trying to, we're not trying to live a life so somebody thinks we're a good guy. That's, that's not living. We're Christian life properly. We, we try to do the right thing because we love Jesus. Fourthly, faithfulness and suffering. I don't know if the name Eric Little means anything to you. I loved the movie when it came out a long time ago, Chariots of Fire, um, which is a true story about this fine Christian man who was a great runner, and he was in the Olympics. Any, anybody know this story? It was in the 20s, and he was in Britain, and he was a Scotsman, and his family were missionaries in China. And, and they kind of didn't even want him to take time to be a runner, but he was really good at it. So he came to the Olympics, and on the boat, which was, the Olympics were in France, on the boat over from England, they found out that the heat he was going to have to run, you know how it is, we've all watched track here in Columbus Grove, or a great track town, right? He was running in the heat on Sunday, but here's the tricky bit. Now this wouldn't have been my conviction, but it, it was his conviction. That you didn't do sports on Sunday, that, that sports were only for the Lord. I don't think sports on Sunday should keep us from God's house, but I think sports the rest of the day is fine, but that's my personal view on that. But he, he went and told the Olympic officials from Britain, I can't run on, on Sunday, I'm not going to do it. And they said, well, you know, it's just, it's only a heat. And they tried to get him to go against his convictions and he wouldn't do it. So uh, he was out. You know, he. He, he was going to run, oh boy, I should have checked up on this. I think he was going to run the, the 100 meter. And he was very fast, one of the fastest in the world. But he just said, no, I, my, my allegiance to Christ is uppermost. But finally, one of the other men on the team who was a hurdler said, look, I've already got a, a bronze or silver in the hurdles. How about you let Eric Little run the 400 for me? He, he wasn't a 400 runner. He was a hundred runner. So, you know, he said, sure, just for an opportunity to run in the Olympics, I'll do that. And so they, they let him switch places, and he ran in the 400. And he won the Olympic gold. Now, that's not the most important thing. A lot of people have won Olympic golds, but very few have won Olympic golds standing for their Christian principles. And like I said, I wouldn't view that exactly as he did, but he had to do that because that's what he believed. But when he really showed his faith in Christ was when he went back as a missionary to China and they were taken over by the Japanese and he and other missionaries were in a prisoner of war camp. And pressure, if you haven't noticed, reveals what's inside of us. And other missionaries just became grabby and selfish and just out for themselves like all the veneer of Christian love was gone. You know, they're just fighting for themselves. And, and, and he died in that prisoner of war camp. But everyone there said he served others in love to his dying day. You see, that's an example of faithfulness. Not just in the best of times, but when the pressure of the world comes around us. 
Well, I also want to tell this story, and it might be an urban legend, but I, I heard it as though it were true. It's a wealthy man was in a very prestigious area, uh, you know, out of the country club or something. There was a dance, and he was a, he was a very very wealthy man. He was dancing with some young lady, and he said, "Would you sleep with me for a million dollars?" And she said, "Well, sure." And he said, "Well, how about a hundred dollars?" And she slapped him and said, "What kind of girl do you think I am?" And he said, "We've already established that. Now we're just talking price." <laughs> You, you often hear the phrase, you often hear the phrase, every man has his price. Not every Christian man. A Christian man, every day, wants to please God most. And so, you know, as Christians, no matter what, somebody would bribe us or pay us to do the wrong thing. It's never just a little thing. We always want to say yes to Jesus. And finally, there's a faithfulness with words, which we just need to remind ourselves. And see, all of these, you know, probably most, most of us need to go back and say, Lord, forgive me, I've not really been faithful in this area. Help me. And he will. He understands that we've not arrived on this journey. But the Lord tells us to be so faithful in our words that we never need to swear. The people will say, if Matt Reem says it, you can take it to the bank. He always tells the truth. Now, who, who is it that always lies? No one. No one. There's not a person on earth that always lies. A liar is the person who does not always tell the truth. And so, Paul said to the Ephesians, Come on, folks. We're in Christ. No more lying. We just have to say, that, you know, to be faithful means, you know, we, that's, that's the way we were before we came to Christ. No more lying than that. You know, sometimes we just talk less and that helps. It's amazing. You don't really need to lie. I was, I've been in work situations where my bosses said, lie about this. And you don't have to. There are always other ways of handling that. And then finally, faithfulness in marriage. I often think of a man, I won't say his name because he's from Putnam County. And he was faithful to his wife. I thought of just the most difficult situation I had ever seen. I mean, if there was ever a time that people would say, well, there's a man that has a, an excuse to not be faithful to his wife. But he was faithful. And he, he's a quiet guy. You probably never heard of him. And I, wouldn't be, I just wouldn't be surprised if we get to heaven. And if there are seats or something closer to Jesus, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those is his. Now, if you start feeling like, boy, this Christianity thing is too hard, talk about faithfulness in the sacraments, and faithfulness at work, and faithfulness with words, it's, it's too hard. It would be in our strength. And that's why Jesus sent his Holy Spirit, who produces the fruit in us as we yield to him. I'm going to read a prayer and ask you to pray this with me. <coughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for your great mercy. Deliver us from unfaithfulness. Deliver us from self-directed lives. Enable us to daily yield all of our lives to you. For the glory of Christ. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for your great mercy. Thank you for your great mercy. Deliver us from unfaithfulness. Deliver us from Deliver us from self-directed lives. Enable us to daily yield all of our lives to you for the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves the little children, including you.
thank you for your great mercy. Thank you for your presence with us here together. Lord, we just love you. And we humbly ask for your help, for the work of the Holy Spirit to enable us to be faithful. And Lord, since your arm is not short, we also pray that you would give us hope and that you would give us joy and that you would give us everything we need in these days. For the glory of Christ we pray. Amen.